Hey everybody, before I get started, I just wanted to mention a couple of ways that you can engage with me on a more personal level. I have a few avenues set up and I keep focusing on one and I figured, why don't I make a short little video talking about all of them real quick before we get into these uh, episodes. So first thing, Patreon. There's a link in the episode description and every episode description to the Patreon, as well as uh, a video on the feed called Major Announcement that has all the details of what each tier offers and how much they cost. I implore you to check that out. I offer a lot of cool shit for my patrons. Uh, second thing, the Discord channel. There's also a Discord link in the episode description and in every episode description. I have multiple channels set up there for each show that I'm covering, and it's a great way to just engage with me. I have a channel set up for... Uh, uh, MMA talk as well. I'm a big MMA fan. So if you're an MMA fan, you can check that out as well. There's a link to the discord in the episode description. And then lastly, oh, the Facebook and Twitter, social media, follow me on there. I post news on there. When I say news, I mean like, hey, I'm stopping covering this show. Hey, I'm starting covering this show. Let me know what you think about this. I do uh, live watches of things on Facebook where like I'll check in and say, I'm watching so-and-so show. And then I'll like live comment while I'm watching it. And that'll be cool if maybe you watch that show too and you want to watch along with me or you're watching it later and you want to see my thoughts, which are usually pretty entertaining because I'm usually pretty high when I'm writing them. So uh, check out all those links in each episode description and let's talk about this episode. Peace. One mic, one mic. Yeah. All I need is one mic. One mic. All I need is one mic. Hey everybody, welcome back to One Mic. And today I'm here to talk about season two, episodes one and two of HBO Max's Tokyo Vice. So uh, season one of Tokyo Vice, it was one of my favorite shows of uh, 2022. It didn't crack my top 10, but 2022 was one of the strongest years of television in recent memory. So uh, that's, that's really not a knock on season one. It made my honorable mentions in a year when my honorable mentions were full of shows that will probably make the top 10 in, in other years. I covered season one here on this channel. If you look, you'll see that the coverage is incomplete, unfortunately. And again, not due to me not liking the show. It's due to a combination of when the show was released and how it was released. So back in 2022, I mean, it's like it was a long ass time ago. Uh, season one was on Max at a time when Max was still trying to like wrap their head around release schedules especially during this time of like uh when they were trying to balance like you know with their movies putting stuff in the theaters or just putting it on tv and then with their tv originals they were just kind of putting those things out how did they want to do that did they want to do it week to week did they want you know find something in between with the, uh week to week and what netflix was doing and what they were doing is they were routinely putting out their their max originals they put out like three episodes on the first week and then like two to three on each subsequent week after that, depending on what the show is, like they, they did this with Hacks, uh, they did it with, um, uh, what was the one with Kaylee Cuoco, uh, Flight Attendant, uh, they did it with Raised by Wolves, they did it with uh, Tokyo Vice, and this is fun for watching, like it's cool to get multiple episodes at a time, but it's not so much fun for someone like myself, who uh, either would have to watch three episodes before he could record one video, or would have to do something even worse, which is, you know, watch three episodes and record three videos, and trying to put them out in a timely manner, it was just not a good look for me at that time. Um, by the end of season one of Tokyo Vice, recording the videos, it was too daunting of a task given my other obligations with the channel at the time. So that's why the coverage isn't complete. Why am I telling you this? You're like, when is he going to talk about the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> fucking episodes. For starters, it's again to confirm that my incomplete coverage isn't due to me disliking the show. Uh, the reality is to the contrary. But secondly, and more importantly, when I was preparing for season two and worrying about how long it's been since season one and how my coverage is incomplete, I noticed that I still had full notes for those final three episodes of season one. I just never recorded the videos. So reading the notes coupled with a really good uh, season one recap prior to the start of season two was more than enough to prepare me for the new season. So if you're worried about how long it's been since season one, don't watch the recap. You'll be good to go. If you're worried about how long it's been since I've, <laughs> since I've watched and talked about this show, don't. I'm good to go. Uh, another thing that helps with jogging your season one memories, the season two picks up right where season one left off. And I want to start at the very obvious location of the beginning, because despite the fact that the first episode picks up where season one left off, it did kind of drag. But uh, here's the thing. That's not really meant to be a criticism in this case. Uh, episode one, I thought, was really effective because uh, the season one finale felt kind of rushed and incomplete. And, and this premiere episode 
almost simultaneously served as kind of like an addendum to the season one finale and as a season two kind of like preview almost. It kind of wrapped up what was left from season one, laid the foundation for season two, which then made episode two feel more like a traditional kind of season premiere, and it made the decisions to, decision to drop those first two episodes at the same time make a lot of sense. Uh, my only real complaint about season, uh, I'm sorry, episode one, and it's a minor one, is that they didn't end with something a little bit more impactful. Like, they, they had this thing where, like, they made it seem like Katagiri being at this this vice minister's house was like, I don't know, like, it was some really heavy shit. And him willing to color outside the line, so to speak, is like, I mean, it's fine, but it's not the mic drop that they made it to be. And if that's my biggest complaint so far is that they had kind of, like, what they thought was going to be a mic drop moment at the end of the episode and it wasn't, I think it's a pretty good episode. Uh, having said that, let's go over what we learned from episode one, talk about what episode two set up and wrap this thing up, uh, and then I will get on to recording a video for episode three. So like I've said already, episode one, it wastes no time picking up at the exact moments where season one ended. At the end of season one, Jake was arriving at Categories with the tape of Paulina possibly being murdered. We don't know. That's very much up in the air. Uh, but the fact that everyone is openly assuming she's dead makes me think that she's probably going to turn up alive at some point. Uh, Sam, uh, she was getting in bed with the Yakuza to fund her uh, her club since she got robbed of her final payment. And Sato, who was appointed to oversee her and this club, had just been stabbed. Uh, as we open season two, we're in the moments following Jake arriving at Katagiri's house. Uh, they watch the tape. Uh, Katagiri recognizes one of the men in the, fo uh, in the video to be... Uh, the guy I just mentioned a moment ago, the vice, uh, I have his title here, Vice Minister of Foreign Affairs. Uh, they agree to take the tape to the paper, and Katagiri is going to try to figure out who sent it and eventually try to arrest Tozawa, tie him into it, uh, as Jake had identified one of Tozawa's henchmen in the video as well. Uh, they can't release the story without a quote from the Vice Minister, but the Vice Minister tells Jake and Emi, Imi, I don't know how, I, I, I'm pretty sure I was calling, it, calling her Emi. E-M-I, which is, I, I was in my notes, but the captions now have E-I-M-I. -I. I, I don't know. I'm going to call her i -me. I don't know. Or I just call her E. I don't know. Whatever. But uh, the price, vice minister tells Jake and E that, that it's not him in the video and he has no comment. And Jake, apparently having learned nothing from season one about Japanese culture like I did, <laughs> he speaks out of turn. He tells the vice minister, he's like, yeah, we know since I always got you hemmed up, man. Why don't you just give him up? And I'm <laughs> I just thought that was a funny scene just because I'm, I'm like, like the vice minister is like, who is this motherfucker talking out of tire? This white boy coming up here. And when he's doing this, I'm like, Jake, you haven't learned to shut the fuck. Like, this is not your moment to speak right now, Jake. But um, Jake's work homies, they find out uh, that the yacht that Polina was on is registered to uh, Mazaka. That is the uh, uh, mistress, love interest or whatever of Tozawa that we saw in season one that uh, her and Jake were kind of flirting. But just as they get close to being able to publish that article, the news, there's somebody sets a fire in the newsroom or tries to blow it up, whatever, uh, and the tape is lost, and thus they can't put out the article. Uh, to make matters worse, Katagiri tells Jake that Miyamoto, who was the cop who uh, Jake was getting info from, and they were learning martial arts together in season one, uh, he's now dead. Looks like an overdose, but uh, Miyamoto had a picture of him and Katagiri talking in his hand, uh, informing Katagiri and us, the audience, that... Uh, one, that these meetings that they had where they were plotting on Tozawa were known, and two, that he was probably actually killed and it was just made to look like a suicide. Uh, so he tells Jake uh, that uh, that this has to be a secret and that they need to lay low for a while before they can go after Tozawa. And I'm a bit concerned here because, as we'll come to understand when I continue talking about this episode, there's a lot of knowledge getting to people in, in unexplained ways. And I don't know if that's going to bother me going forward, but I do know that everything tracking... Uh, makes a show or a film better. So I hope we really find out like who took that picture and, and got that info to Tozawa. And it might not seem important. You might just look at that and be like, who gives a fuck? Like it, it was known that they were uh, that they were having you know meetings about Tozawa, and that's why he was that's why he was killed. And that's perfectly fine. I definitely wouldn't uh, fault you for feeling that way. And I, to a degree, feel that way. It's just that those small details are the difference between a good show and a great one. And I want this to be a great show and I want everything to add up and track. So, um, just kind of, you know, I, I wouldn't even call it a concern. Cause like I said, I, I feel like I don't necessarily need that info either, but it's something that's on my mind. I kind of expect the show to, to, I expect great shows to give me that information. 
Uh, I like how after that scene, uh, one of Jake's newspaper friends says that he heard that uh, Miyamoto didn't OD and that he plans on investigating. And then rather than going, you're right, he did. <laughs> I mean, he didn't OD like you'd expect Jake to do. Jake actually followed Katagiri's instructions that played up uh, heart issues for, for uh, Miyamoto. So at the start of season two, uh, Jake, Jake feels like he's close to being able to write this scathing story about Tozawa that'll do justice for Polina, but hey, as it all snatched away at the last minute. And I think this is a good time to segue to the Katagiri portion of the show. It obviously converges with the Jake stuff. It contains some of the bigger moments, I think, of the episode. So uh, after Jake and Katagiri separate, Katagiri gets a delivery to the office that's a book of matches from a hotel with Miyamoto's name and room number written on it. When he gets there, he finds Miyamoto's body, obviously, which I've already discussed. The important piece here is what happens with that info. He goes to a guy who I assume is his boss, and he's like, yo, Tozawa murdered one of our guys. We got to do something. What the fuck? And the boss kind of... <laughs> this is actually kind of funny. He can choose out Katagiri for secretly meeting with Miyamoto in the first place, and he, like, essentially blames him for everything, and... and it sounded to me like in that moment, like he suspended him, like case closed, leave it alone. Uh, we're done here. You're done here. It, it very much sounded like he was not just uh, had a guilt trip laid on him, but he also like, I don't, I don't think he lost his job, but he just, you know, he, he's off that case and probably, uh, I think he, I think the guy said something like to go, go home to his family or something like that. It read to me like he was suspended or something. Katagiri then decides to take things into his own hands, like I mentioned at the top, breaks to the vice minister's house, holds him at knife point in an attempt to find out why Tozawa will be blackmailing him with the Polina videos. Um, like I said, him willing to go outside the law to get answers is treated like a mic drop here, but it was a kind of an underwhelming way to end the episode, I think. And that's also, that's kind of a played out trope, right? Like, cop can't get things done going by the book, eventually gets frustrated enough to burn the book and break the rules in service of justice. Like, we see that a lot. I hope there's something special planned for, for that and not just your generic, like, category goes farther and farther toward the dark side, eventually becoming no better than Tozawa himself in his quest to catch him. Like, I hope it's not something really predictable and formulaic like that. Uh, moving on to Sato, he doesn't uh, appear much in the first episode. He only has one speaking line, but his storyline was heavily advanced in episode one. So when we open the episode, Sam's at her new club as she's greeted by Nan Sato uh, Yakuza, and Sato's brother is looking for him as well. This is actually the moment when I realized just how close we were to uh, season one. I was like, where's Sato? Why is he not at the club? <laughs> and uh, I just naturally assumed that time had passed. I don't know why I assumed that, but I did. It wasn't until like that moment in the episode, which was fairly late to the episode, that I realized, like, holy shit, we're right where season one left off. Sato might still be bleeding in the street for all I know. <laughs> That's why he's not at Sam's. Uh, that wasn't quite the case, but he was still... Uh, we are still very much fresh off of that injury. Injury makes it sound like he, <laughs> like he tripped and stubbed his toe. Uh, but uh, he turns up at the hospital looking uh, pretty close to death. Uh, sooner thereafter, his brother arrives. Uh, his Yakuza brothers arrive as well. And they take him out of the hospital altogether because apparently they like to handle everything in-house. Uh, I thought that was kind of weird. But again, picking up the culture, right? If that's how the Yakuza gets down, I'm going to trust that that's properly researched and that's something that they would do. I kind of like this scene because in that moment, I'm like, why are they so aggressively taking him out of a place that's meant to help him? But then, like I said, the question to that answer kind of gives some insight uh, on how they conduct themselves. But throughout these scenes, everyone's pledging that whoever stabs Sato is going to pay for it. And every time somebody says something like that, they pan to the dude who did it. <laughs> if that's the dude who did it, he's just standing there looking nervous. Uh, I, I love like when they would do that, you just look, <laughs> look at his face. Especially in, um, I think it was the hospital scene where they take him out of the hospital. Like, or, or yeah, because the first time when, when his brother comes, it's not that bad. But when they take him out of the hospital, they pan to that guy. <laughs> it looks like he's shitting on himself. I love it. Uh, that same guy, uh, he goes to one of Tozawa's men to offer up Ishida once, once he hears that Sato is ex expected to live. But Tozawa's guy, uh, Yabuka, I believe is his name, Yabuki, something like that, uh, he actually turns over uh, Sato's attacker to Ishida and tries to make peace. And he didn't fuck with Tozawa like that. I kind of hope this is a setup and this guy isn't uh, doesn't actually want to make peace, but uh, I guess we'll see. Anyway, the moment that Sato's eyes open and Shida puts a knife in his hand and says it's time to kill the guy who stabbed him, Sato spares him, speaking his one line of the episode, and Ishida basically tells the guy uh, that he's basically <laughs> he's basically Sato's slave now uh, until he becomes worthy of the mercy that Sato just showed him. Mm, excuse me. So Sato opens up season two alive, barely. 
but possibly with a guy who's going to be doing his bidding. I, I don't know. And last we have Sam. Uh, she didn't get to do shit in episode one other than more Polina over the course of several scenes and go too hard at Jake for wanting info about Polina for a story. I thought the Sam stuff dragged uh, far too long in this episode, had minimal impact on the story. And then they named the episode after a sentence that Polita says in a flashback that had no impact on the episode whatsoever. <laughs> like the episode is called Don't Fucking Miss, obviously with the you and fucking censored out or something like that. And Polina says in this story about a, a, about a wolf that she's trying to catch or whatever. Uh, and she, she says, like, uh, she misses it and her dad tells her don't fucking miss or something like that. Nobody fucking misses. Uh, it's just a line from a story that's meant to elevate the importance of Polina to Sam. And it was the really underwhelming reason for the title. But that's where Sam starts season two. Uh, drinking excessively over Polina. That's pretty much it. A lot of work to be done on, on uh, Sam's plotline in the second episode. And they do this work with a, a time jump of what I believe is about three months. Well, I don't believe it was three months. Uh, I like this strategy because, like I said at the top, it felt like they used episode one to close out season one properly. And now they're like, we can jump ahead three months and tell the story that we want to tell for season two. At Sam's Club, it's now, it's now open, thriving. Um, I'd call bullshit on her being this successful if it wasn't for the fact that the Yakuza backs the club. So whatever. But it's called Club Polina, lamed after, obviously, <laughs> Polina. Uh, and she runs a pretty tight ship. Uh, this girl who brings in the most money is off the, uh, she's caught skimming off the top. Uh, and Sam fires her, knowing this is going to cause her to lose some pretty big, uh, pretty big clients. What was her name? Claudia? Uh, I mentioned a moment ago that Sam spent the majority of episode one kind of drunkenly pining over Polina. Uh, well, she was also calling someone named Erica uh, to try to get in touch with her and just kept getting put to voicemail. Well, in this episode, she finally uh, gets in touch with Erica and offers her the job as the new number one girl, replacing, uh, like I said, Claudia, whatever, uh, and to potentially win back some of these high-paying customers. One in particular, uh, he's a guy named <laughs> he's a guy named Ono. <laughs> I guess that's like foreshadowing. Oh no, but uh, he's an architect. Uh, but he's more interested in Sam than Erica, and I'm really excited to see how Sato is going to handle that. But uh, let's talk about Sato because three months have not been kind to him. Uh, we get a lot more about him in this episode as opposed to his... I, I failed to mention that I've transitioned now into episode two, but <laughs> um, we get a lot more of him in this episode than we did in episode one. Uh, for starters, uh, dude who stabbed him is, <laughs> is like his chauffeur now or something. <laughs> I love it. I don't know, but uh, I don't know if they're going to play up a can Sato trust this guy uh, angle, but I kind of hope not. Hope that guy. I hope that guy becomes Sato's most loyal soldier. Like that, that would be sweet. Like we see Sato like move up into the move up in the ranks of future seasons. That guy is kind of like becomes like his right hand man. That'd be kind of cool. And be like, yeah, he tried to stab that motherfucker back in the day. Anyway, uh, Sato is gonna need him because we meet a new character in this episode named Hayama, who is clearly gonna be a huge fucking problem. This guy. Uh, he lives off at university, <laughs> and I loved how the subtitles put that in quotes. Like. It I think we're meant to understand that he was probably in prison, actually. Uh, but now that he's back, he's going to be Ishida's number two guy, and Sato's going to be the number three reporting to Hayama. Anyways, Hayama wastes no time letting us know what kind of leader he's going to be. Uh, him and Sato roll up on one of Tozawa's starts to start smacking motherfuckers around, taking money, and they're like, you don't pay Tozawa's shit no more. You are Chihara Kai now. That's it. That's it. I just, I just let the, I just let his clan name just roll right off the tongue. Shit wasn't even in my notes, bitch. I probably pronounced it all fucked up. Uh, he then proceeds to talk about how soft everyone has gotten in, in his absence. And I'm, I don't know, I'm excited for the chaos that this guy is going to introduce to the season. Uh, also, Sato's little brother, who was looking for him in episode one, he wants a real job with the Yakuza. And in my favorite funny moment of these first two episodes, Sato's like, how good are you with computers? And gives him a job as like Yakuza IT setting up a bootleg sneaker selling site. What? <laughs> like, man, yeah, I got a job for you. Make a fucking Yakuza eBay. <laughs> like, what the fuck? Oh, man. It's such a ridiculous turn of events, though, that I'm sure it's going to go somewhere interesting. It's just funny right now. Like, somehow his brother's shoe website is going to uh, get him entangled with someone dangerous looking to buy knockoff Jordan 11s. I don't know. Um, lastly, despite being told they don't use guns, Sato buys one anyway, and he stashes it in a locker at Sam's Club. I'm sure nothing's going to go wrong there. And I want to close out with talking about where we find Jake and Katagiri after this three-month time jump. I gotta admit, on the surface, 
Uh, it's not that interesting, but it also gives me a vibe kind of similar to what Slow Horses Season 3 did this year. Uh, Slow Horses started off making it seem like the season was going to be about acquiring a file, and it became so much more than that, and it ended up being Slow Horses' best season. Well, this episode makes it seem like Jake's arc is going to be about this stolen motorcycle gang, uh, but it's which is far less interesting than the Yakuza and Dead Polina, but I've got a pretty strong faith that, like Slow Horses, this is going to become something much bigger than a story about stealing motorcycles. Like, that is probably going to somehow bleed into the larger story about Tozawa and the Yakuza and all, all everything that's going on. So it's been three months. Jake's excelling at the Macho. Uh, Maiko, Macho, 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 yeah. Uh, in episode one, Katagiri told him that, they, like I said, they got to bide their time before they can go after Tozawa. And we learned that Jake's been following that direction in that time. He turns down a juicy Yakuza story to take the one about the motorcycle thefts. Katagiri, on the other hand, he seems to have been demoted to the complaints department <laughs> because he's being held responsible for Miyamoto's death, like I said, which is just, just wild. Katagiri tells Jake that he learned that Tozawa was trying to get his name off this no-fly list so he could come here to the United States. And Jake shares that he's learned nothing more about who said the Polita tape, so they haven't progressed much in three months in that regard. Uh, Jake goes to visit Sam and asks her if she can give him a lead for his motorcycle story as she does the whole, oh, so that's why you're here thing that I'm getting really tired of. Like, just because he asked for a lead doesn't mean that's why he came. And I, I don't like the fact that he can't ask about it without her accusing him of that. Uh, his purpose could have been to talk about Polina, but it would be stupid to not also ask for Lee while he's there. Like, what the fuck? I don't like the idea that if he does that, that somehow that's the real reason that he came. But that's a personal nitpick, I think, and not necessarily a flaw with the show. It's just, I I'm tired of her hitting him with that over and over. Uh, right or wrong, though, that's an accurate portrayal of how someone would likely respond to him asking for that lead. So I guess I can't get too mad about it. Uh, but despite her being all haughty about it, she does give him a lead, and that lead tells him that bike parts are more popular than the bikes themselves and points him in the direction of this motorcycle gang. Uh, I don't know how I feel about what happens next from a critical perspective, but I know I laughed quite a bit. Uh, so <laughs> Jake pops up uh, on his motorcycle gang at this restaurant. He wants to buy them dinner. A fight ensues, and with Jake's displays of his martial arts prowess that he learned from Miyamoto, he instantly gains these guys Full respect and approval. And like, I don't know. I just thought that was ridiculous. Like, these motherfuckers reacted like fucking anime characters uh, to him doing like a basic fucking flipping a guy over his shoulder or whatever, and then gave him such unfettered access that I just simultaneously laughed and rolled my eyes at like the sheer audacity of this. And then, as if that wasn't funny enough, <laughs> and I'm telling you guys, like, I'm not trying to be mean. I, I really like both of these episodes, but man, this shit was funny. The long-haired leader of the gang, he's basically like, yeah, if I steal enough, <laughs> if I steal enough bikes, I can put my sister through college. Get her the fuck out of Tokyo. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, is this like Japanese boys in the hood or some shit? <laughs> like, what's, if I steal enough bicycles, I can <laughs> You'll pay for college, too. Okay, let me stop. I get the parts are worth more than the bikes, I guess. Uh, so he explains to Jake how they how they drill into the ignition on these bikes to steal them. And Jake he gives Jake a demonstration and they unwittingly end up looping Jake. Well, no, Jake ends up unwittingly looped into uh, stealing someone's bike. And we also saw a bike stolen to open, uh, open the episode as well. Uh, lastly, Tozawa's mistress, fed up with not being able to find Tozawa and realizing that without him, no one's going to pay her any attention. She decides she's going to fuck Jake now. I... I I felt like that was kind of rushed and I didn't really like it, but I do like the prospects of how badly this will go for Jake because he continues to be a stupid American who doesn't learn. Uh, so I want to close by close this portion of the episode because I feel like I've said lastly or I want to close multiple times, but I covered two episodes here. I want to close uh, talking about episode two and close this video by talking about Katagiri. So like I mentioned earlier, he was demoted to this complaints department. However, a new woman comes in, uh, uh, Nagata, Nagati, Nagata. Yeah, uh, and she's starting a task, task force to go after the Yakuza, and she wants the guy who knows the most about them, that being Katagiri, to lead the team. And he initially turns it down, but when his right, wife refuses to come home because it's not safe, I guess he's like, well, shit, I guess I might as well uh, get back at this shit officially. If she ain't gonna come home, fuck it. And he agrees, that's, not, that's more or less what he said, uh, Ken, Ken Watanabe. And he agrees to join this task force that's gonna hunt the Yakuza in experimental ways. So like I said before, uh, these were effective episodes. They didn't do anything particularly spectacular on their own, but they did do a great job of closing out season one, setting up season two. And even though uh, what they set up so far 
feels, you know, we're, we're like, I don't want to say basic, but like we haven't gotten too much yet to be intrigued by. I'm pretty confident that it's going to turn into something special and I'm excited to see it. Uh, now I'm going to, uh, I, I'm going to close. Uh, no, I'm going to give my thoughts. You guys who've been around, you know, sometimes I give thoughts, kind of like random things or observations uh, at the end of an episode or at the end of a video. I have a couple here. Uh, so I'm just fucking a guy who runs another paper and he wants her to quit the mate show and work for his paper. Uh, nothing much there now, but I feel like that's probably going to be important later, this guy. Uh, Jake also listens to a tape from his sister in the second episode, which reminded me that he... Uh, that they had set up like a you know a troublesome family dynamic for Jake as it pertains to his father and his sister. And I really hope, really hope they explore that more this season. Uh, it was really underserved in season one, and I was interested in it. So I hope they uh, expound on that a little bit more this season. And then lastly, I wonder if Jake's homie at the paper taking up baking. I wonder if that's going to matter at all. I feel like it is, but we'll see. So uh, that's all I got for episodes one and two. I will be covering this week to week. Uh, I will be back for episode three. And until then, peace.